Hello, good night, everyone. My name is Renata Ole Monteiro. I'm an LLM student at Columbia Law School. And together with my colleague, Mateo Vergias, I would like to welcome you all to the panel Arbitration Careers in the US, first round, the Latin American Perspective. It is a true honor for us, um, Columbia School uh, students, to have these three amazing guests with us tonight to share their views and experiences on the topic. So on behalf of the Columbia International Arbitration Association, I would like to thank uh, deeply to Jonathan, Gaelia, and Guilherme for joining us tonight. This event is also being held in cooperation with Arbitration Channel. So we would like them uh, to thank them for streaming the event and making it available on YouTube. Okay, thank you very thank much, you. Renata. Uh, the topic of this event is basically self-evident from the title, uh, which is how to procure and develop a career in arbitration in the U.S. So in order to provide us this input, we have Jonathan Hamilton, who is a co-head of the International Arbitration Group of White and Case, based in D.C. Then we have Gaela Gerin Flores, who is a partner at the International Arbitration Team of Allen and Overy, and finally, Guillem Resena Costa, who is an associate at the International Arbitration Team of the Boys. Now, the discussion will be structured in two parts. First, the law firm perspective, and second, the student perspective. So from the law firm perspective, we would like to know how do law firms look for Latin American candidates and what do they look in a Latin American candidate? So Jonathan, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mateo, Renata, and to my colleagues on the panel. It's a pleasure to be with you and a pleasure to be uh, back with Columbia Law School and the International Arbitration Association, where over many years I've had the opportunity to speak on a variety of different uh, topics and really good to be with you tonight. As a starting point, I think it's important to keep in mind that the best thing that you can do to develop your legal career is to try to be the best possible substantive lawyer at what you're interested in. That means you need to not only take seriously the field of interest arbitration, but also try to understand um, what motivates disputes that are of the type that interest you, because that makes you more alert substantively to where disputes come from and how they get resolved. Now, when the field of arbitration was much smaller than it is today, say, you know, 20, 25 years ago, when investment disputes were just taking off, it was literally 25 years ago when uh, the first exit arbitration related to a Latin American state was, was um, ongoing just 25 years ago. So you're talking about a field that really exploded, but the field exploded in a very particular um, economic and political context of what was happening in Latin America and what kind of disputes that generated. So in the 1990s, you had privatization of public utilities, you had uh, privatization of telecommunications, uh, a lot of changes in the fundamental economic infrastructure of the region that you could basically look uh, a few years down the road and say billions of dollars is pouring into these different countries. There will be disputes that follow. You can count on it. It keeps lawyers uh, busy worldwide at all times. And, and that's exactly what happened. There were uh, lots of investment inflows in the region, and that created both commercial disputes and investment disputes. So if you look at the current moment that we're in, uh, we are in a period of great change. There have been significant uh, challenges and transitions in Latin America in the past several years, probably in a way that um, were not fully foreseen including uh, the general disruption of political attitudes toward globalization. Um, I would say an er erosion of confidence in the strengths of globalization, whether, whether you think that's correct or not, 
Um, it has had a political impact in the region. Uh, second, broad political scandals in the region in many different countries has led to a uh, perception of erosion of uh, self-governance, erosion of views on uh, democracy. The pandemic, of course, has had uh, a major impact on Latin American countries as well. I'll just give you one example. Uh, in one country in South America, there were protests related to issues of inequality in uh, po political and economic inequality. These protests caused disruption to long-term concession projects. Uh, the disruption of long-term concession projects caused friction between the investor and the government, but it also caused friction between two different foreign companies who were engaged in a private transaction related to that project. And so something that stemmed from a disruptive political moment then generated commercial disputes um, in the M&A universe, as well as investor state type of issues as well. And so just take that small example and imagine the many complexities in our world today. And that gives you an idea of where things are headed in the future and the new kind of disputes that will come along. So m my starting point is focus on being the best substantive lawyer you can be, on being as conversant as you can be with um, the substantive issues that are subject to arbitration. And then within that, of course, on issues related to arbitration and how they may relate to your particular country of origin. In, in my case, for example, um, whereas many of you may be non-US lawyers interested in work opportunities in Washington, London, New York, for example, uh, I did it in reverse when I was a US JD student and I went and actually was a foreign associate at a firm in South America. And so I sort of went through an experience in the way that many US lawyers do not. And it was very important to my perception of where disputes were likely to arise in the future. So we will, over the course of the discussion, go into some of the practicalities, things you should think about, how to present yourself. But I just wanna say as a starting point that Firms like, uh, firms like ours and those of my colleagues are um, very dynamic and demanding environments. That's what, makes it, um, that's what makes it fun and interesting. And so go in with that spirit of interest and motivation and the substance of what we do. And that will help in turn um, make the particular things that you may bring from your background or your prior work or your particular um, national background and show them in their best light. Okay, thank you very much, Jonathan, for clearly setting the stage for the upcoming discussion. So now we turn to Gaela. Uh, we would like to know, if possible, um, basically, uh, how can a Latin American candidate be an asset for a firm? Thanks. Sure, and, and certainly um, just wanting to echo Jonathan's comments on, um, you know, just being a spectacular lawyer, um, being good at whatever area of the law really interests you is, is truly an asset to a law firm. Um, so what I think law firms are really looking for um, and what and the way in which law firms can really benefit from legal practitioners from Latin America um, is, I mean, I guess it just, the, the answer just kind of writes itself. In international arbitration, there are many, many disputes going on involving Latin American entities, involving Latin American interests. Uh, and the way in which U.S. law firms can benefit from Latin American lawyers getting involved is simply by being able to take advantage of their expertise. As Jonathan mentioned, 
being able to have in-house knowledge on the legal regimes of the Latin American countries where your disputes are happening is truly invaluable. And therefore, if you are a legal practitioner or lawyer in, in Latin America, and you are particularly knowledgeable of the legal concepts that come up quite often in international arbitration disputes, um, whether that's administrative law um, from the Latin American perspective, um, derecho administrativo, um, civil law or contractual law um, in Latin America, those sorts of perspectives are extremely helpful. Um, and just having insight even into the legal market uh, in any given country, because for these disputes, law firms are going to want to be seeking assistance in terms of local counsel in, in different Latin American jurisdiction, jurisdictions and independent experts as well. So, you know, it's really a valuable um, asset to any law firm in the United States um, or outside Latin America to have insight into who are the most important voices in a given Latin American country with respect to administrative law, with respect to civil law, with respect to um, intellectual property, uh, with respect to public-private partnerships, um, you name it. There are a, a host of specialties and it's always good if you have someone on your team from that country who knows the market um, and who knows who the, the, the most compelling voices are in these spaces and knows who can help your team the best. Um, but, but yeah, I, just to underscore Jonathan's point again, um, the way that law firms can use lawyers from Latin America and their practices um, really, really depends on the skills of, of any given lawyer. Uh, and what we do in international arbitration is we research and we write and we have a lot of attention to detail. So if in your career you focus on those three things and you excel in those three things, then um, law firms in the United States can, can definitely benefit from your presence. Great, fantastic. So basically, um, substance, ultimately. Um, now, uh, Guillermo, uh, or Guy, as they, as they call you, would like to know a little bit about what are the main learnings that you got from your pers personal career path? Great, with, uh, with pleasure. Um, I mean, I, I will underscore again uh, what both Jonathan and, and Gaila have said about the importance of just adding substance and being a great lawyer uh, day in and day out every day. Uh, but in terms of learnings and things that I think I've learned along the way in these many years now at Deborah Voice, uh, I wanted to make three, uh, I think, essential points. Um, and the first is a little bit contrarian at this point, but it is don't get pigeonholed. And by that, I mean, it's very easy for us to get branded as a Latin American associate and, and sort of full stop, right? Um, after all, most of us would have been hired because of our Latin American background to do exactly the things that Gaila was talking about, to be conversant with local legal systems and with people uh, in the, the host jurisdictions where disputes are arising from. So it's kind of natural that you get involved mostly with LATAM cases. Um, well, one thing that I think I've learned along the way, it's, it's not, you know, doing only LATAM work is not necessarily helpful. And instead, I typically advise sort of the more junior associate staff uh, to seek opportunities and to try to preserve time to do work regarding other regions too. And, and for that, there's actually, I think, three sort of sub reasons why I think that's important. First, it's, 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 it's a good hedging strategy. Uh, and this may apply in particular if you're Brazilian, not so much Hispanic speaking, but you know, these are, these are uh, volatile countries sometimes. Uh, disputes will ebb and flow in accordance with what's happening in any one of these given jurisdictions. So doing other work in other regions is also a good way to make sure 
you're sort of protected against uh, a legal bear market, if you will. Uh, the second thing is, is doing work in other regions and with other people keeps you on your toes. Uh, and I think this again resonates with what seems to be the core theme of, of our seminar today, which is by doing that, you are developing better, you know, you're, you're developing and polishing your skills as a lawyer and that makes you a better lawyer. And so you can only gain from, from you know, keeping it challenging, keeping it interesting and even keeping it fun by doing different sorts of things. So not necessarily, you know, invest in state cases all the time, but some m &A disputes. And, you know, some people even uh, do a little bit of arbitration, a little bit of white collar, which is increasingly rare, but still it's all, it's all I think, good experience, especially in the early years. Um, and I think the third thing about doing work out of other regions, it allows you to get to know other people within your firm. Uh, and of course, we're talking about very big firms here. And in the long run, it is actually, of course, you know, there's a lot of governance and these firms are all highly institutionalized. But it is important also to get to know people on a personal level. Uh, you learn from them, you, you make new friendships and along your career path, uh, that's something that I think helps a lot to get to know more people. Um, the, the second point I was going to say, but I think we sort of beat this to death, is just develop substantive skills right along the way. Uh, and, and I think the way to do that in particular is to, uh, and it might happen by you know accident more than design, but it's to focus on specific areas that interest you in terms of subject matter. So for me, to give an example, my, my personal example is I've been doing a lot of mining disputes. I do a lot of damages work with experts, and I do quite a few post m disputes. And again, a little bit more, but more by accident than design, these things sort of to te you know, tended to, to show up on my desk and I did them once and I did them again and now I'm sort of a go-to person for that. And I think it's important to be known within your organization as somebody who, is, uh, who has particular expertise in these areas. Um, and the third and final point uh, in terms of the three big, I think, takeaways that I've been able to, to, to get from these years at the firm is don't burn out. Um, you know, I've had a lot of great colleagues and indeed some of my most talented peers uh, who left because they got tired or they got frustrated. Uh, you know, as Jonathan said, these firms are highly demanding and they are like that because we are servicing, you know, the clients who are the major companies in the world. We're trying to deliver the best service possible all the time. And that, of course, takes a strain on your personal life and other commitments. Uh, and so the idea that uh, is often repeated but not taken as seriously as it should, that it's not a sprint, but it's a marathon, I think really applies to life in, in big law. Um, and so what does that mean in practice, right? I'm, I'm saying this and it sounds very abstract, but I think what it means in practice is you have to strike some form of balance. Uh, and what I've at least learned over the years is that balance at any one given point in time is typically not attainable in the sense that if you're gearing up for a hearing, you're of course, you're gonna be like working night in, night out. You're gonna you're gonna be really devoted. Your weekends will be devoted to the case. And you're gonna have a lot of fun along the way. And it's, it's again, the, the demanding nature of our work requires this, right? In order for you to compete. Um, but then over time, I think you can get balance if once your hearing is done, once you've completed the hearing and it's gone well, you know, try and reserve a couple of days after the hearing to go off on a vacation, maybe go back to your home country, visit your parents, visit your friends. Uh, so try, try and sort of balance it out. Again, you probably can't do this at any one point in time, but use the, you know, again, the ebbs and flows of work in order to squeeze in sort of quality time with family and friends. Uh, and I think that's increasingly important now, actually, with the pandemic, because that has really taken, I think, a toll. Uh, on everybody. So, you know, give yourself these breaks and over time, hopefully you can get even healed uh, and make it to the finish line. Yes, okay, thank you very thank you. much. <laughs> uh, moving on to our second discussion, which is about the student perspective. Uh, Jonathan, could you please uh, share your views with us about what should a Latin American uh, candidate do when applying to, uh, for a position at a law firm? And also, uh, what is the importance of having connections with local law firms and companies? Okay, great questions. And um, I think we've kind of been through all the formalities and focus on substance. So let's lighten it up a little bit, I would say. And I also want to encourage people uh, because I know if I was in person that 
I would be walking around and it would be more interactive. So feel free to share. Can they share questions in the chat group as we go along? And, and so feel free to, to do that. So, um, so let's break this down. So first of all, um, uh, let me mention something about my firm, just to give you an example, and I'm sure others can mention the basics of, of their firms. You know, in, in Whiting case, uh, because I know many of you are particularly interested in Latin America, uh, when I started at Whiting Case in the 90s in our New York office, uh, I, I went in and said Latin America and arbitration is going to be the wave of the future. Uh, and, you know, at that moment, I could have said, you know, TikTok is going to be the wave of the future. And I would have gotten a similar look, which is what is TikTok and why is that going to be the wave of the future? Um, but now, of course, this is a, a massive field. We have about 250 lawyers in our worldwide arbitration group. And within that, we have uh, 100 people that are routinely working intensely on Latin American matters out of 10 different offices. And so what we've done over time is intentionally work to make sure that we are doing, we do a huge amount here in Washington. It's our biggest cluster of this kind of work, but we're doing it in Paris, Geneva, London, New York. And then we're also doing it in Mexico City, Madrid, Sao Paulo, um, Miami, and Houston. So that we have different clusters of multinational teams of people working on these matters. You know, in Mexico, for example, uh, I, I moved to Mexico early in my career to our Mexico office. And, uh, and over the years, we built up uh, part of our hub there. It's uh, not just Mexicans who are working there. It's a multinational team that has a lot of fluidity with other offices and with how we staff. You know, I literally am, am dealing, for example, just as one example, with Mexico all day, every day. So um, there's a lot of different, you know, ways to go into our firm. And what we did is we established just to kind of get a little more formal about how we're going about this, especially for the Americas offices, is uh, we created the Latin American Arbitration Fellows Program. And so um, we are, you know, receiving CVs for the Fellows Program. Uh, in that regard, again, you're at Columbia, you're off to a good start, right? Uh, and uh, you speak Spanish or Portuguese, so you've got that plus. Uh, but all of you could say those things. So uh, one thing that I would emphasize, if you come from a great local firm, great. If you don't, you're not uh, stuck. It doesn't mean that you're not going to be a great candidate. Um, it just means that your profile might be a little bit, uh, a little bit different. And, uh, and so don't lose sleep about that. You can't change what your background is. We all have completely different backgrounds. It's one of the best things about the field of arbitration is the extreme diversity that we all have. We all have completely, you know, uh, I, I come from a small town down South, uh, and started taking Spanish in junior high school. And, you know, here I am. So we all have very different backgrounds and that's good and that's okay. So if you have worked in a, in a great law firm from your home country, great. That's, that's a, that's a plus. But if you haven't, that doesn't mean that, uh, you face a massive obstacle. It just means there are other ways that you can demonstrate your, um, your strengths. And I also would emphasize uh, that there are a lot of different ways that you can show knowledge and show your strengths when you have an interview. And that's important, meaning that you have an awareness of um, either industry issues or political issues that can enhance your knowledge and understanding of where disputes come from. Uh, for example, one thing that we often see is somebody who previously worked in a company or they previously were doing transactional work in, you know, Timbuktu 
uh, law firm. And out of that experience, they developed an interest in arbitration. That's great. That is perfectly great. As a matter of fact, I started out non-committed um, as a practice area because I wanted to get exposure to capital markets and to project finance. And it was one of the best things that I ever did. Um, you have to think about the ways that disputes emerge. Um, I, I think that when I uh, started law school, you know, from a U.S. perspective, I imagined a very stable legal environment and, you know, people get into disputes now and then. Um, in fact, the way that international arbitration works, have you guys ever seen those, you know, instead of just a, a simple model of the solar system where there's the sun and the planets are going in a circle. You know, there's these like 3D models of how everything is spinning around, hurtling insanely through the universe. That's the way the world really works. That's the way that different industries are evolving, changing with uh, environmental concerns. That's the way politics in emerging markets work. They come flying from crazy directions. And so if you can look and say, what's happening in the energy sector in Mexico, for example, or um, how is the oil and gas sector uh, changing? Um, and you're not having to be an expert uh, immediately on this, but you're aware you're well read on these issues and you can bring that to your interviews. I think that's a real, a real plus. Thank you very much. Those were great inputs. Um, Guy, through a market perspective, do you think there is a distinction between Brazilian LLMs and Spanish speaking LLMs? Thank you. Yeah, so I think there definitely is, uh, especially at the time that people are interviewing. And as you know, as Jonathan just said, a lot of uh, power firms will select the best candidates is through assessing their sort of commercial savviness, if I were to wrap that up, uh, which is, you know, understanding of the industry, understanding of the political environment, understanding of how that interacts with the legal systems. And of course, that's going to be different depending on whether you are applying for a role which is primarily geared towards Brazil or a role that's primarily geared towards uh, Hispanic speaking Latin America, right? Um, so if you're Brazilian, of course, the things that will stand out is mostly uh, are mostly your experience or your, uh, again, savviness of commercial uh, and construction arbitration uh, and of political things that are happening in Brazil. And to the extent you can communicate that to your interviewer in a way that's compelling, you know, I, I think that's a, that's a, a, a game changer in a way. Um, if you're, of course, from a Hispanic speaking country in Latin America, then most of these roles uh, are geared towards investor state disputes, because that's what tends to be the, the bread and butter of Hispanic speaking Latin America. So, of course, there you're going to you're going to have to show a different kind of savviness, which is more uh, 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 more alive to issues that affect, again, the sort of the political environment in these many countries. What is happening now uh, in Mexico under the current government and, you know, as we were saying, the, the energy reforms in Mexico, what is happening in the renewable sector, both in Mexico and in other places in Latin America, how are, uh, you know, changes to, to the Chilean pension uh, reforms going to affect potential disputes? So again, that sort of savviness, I think, is, is crucial and it's going to vary between Brazilians and uh, Hispanic speaking LLMs. Having said that, and I, I'm sort of repeating one of the things that I said during my first answer, I think once you're in the firm, uh, I think it changes, uh, which is why I said absolutely there's a difference when you're interviewing. But once you're in the firm, I think I think there tends to be a little bit of a division between, again, Brazil as sort of 50% of Latin America and the rest of Latin America as being sort of the other half. Uh, but, but I think there's a lot of benefits to be gained by people uh, collaborating sort of across the border. Uh, and I think this is both for firms because collaboration always produces, I think, better quality uh, work and results, but also individually for people like you and me, uh, I think if you treat Latin America as a, a sort of integrated whole, that can be uh, beneficial. Uh, and most of the time, it's actually quite easy to do that because the, the underlying skill set is by and large overlapping in terms of 
as Gail was saying, attention to detail, uh, you know, legal writing skills, knowledge of the legal systems, which again are, are largely uh, inspired by European continental European tradition. So there's a lot in common there. The 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 real difficulty is is just language, really. And and I have this, you know, to lighten things up, I have this personal story, which is when this really sort of dawned on me. Uh, we were doing a case um, out of Peru, and we had a work trip to Peru. Um, at the end of the trip, our Peruvian colleagues, local council, they, they kindly took us for, for sort of a night out. So we went to this bar, we had some piscos, we, we chatted, we had a lovely conversation, uh, and we listened to some music at this bar. And it felt, for me as a Brazilian, it felt just like Brazil, sort of the, 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 the warmth of the people and sort of the cultural connections, except when the, this place had sort of a live band and the band started to play some music and everybody got very excited with the Hispanic songs that were playing. They were singing, they were dancing, except me, because I, of course, didn't know the lyrics to any of these songs being Brazilian. And so while everybody was having fun and sort of dancing and chatting and laughing, I was sort of left out. And so the lesson learned for that, and at that moment I realized it's, you know, we have so much in common culturally that you really just have to learn the lyrics. Uh, and by learn the, the lyrics, of course, I mean, you have to, to get, the, get your language skills in place. And so if you're Brazilian, work in Spanish. If you're Hispanic, work in Portuguese, which may seem a little bit daunting, but it really isn't. Uh, and then you can really, I think, leverage this huge cultural overlap that we have, which, you know, again, we have a lot more in common than the things that set us apart, uh, and then unlock or, or, or tap into sort of this other 50% of the market, right? But again, those are all things that you're probably gonna be in a better position to do once you enter the firm rather than during your interview. Having said that, if you already have some of this capability, if you speak some Portuguese or if you're Brazilian and you speak some Spanish, then of course, go for it, right? Like as in like bring this point out in an interview because you can say, I will be a particularly valuable asset to your firm because I am versatile, right? You can put me to do your M&A disputes out of Brazil, but I can also do the investor state arbitrations relating to Colombia or whatever. And so I think that's always obviously a plus. Um, and just one more point then, which is really, uh, I think, tightly connected to this, and uh, but geared primarily towards my compatriots out of Brazil, is of course, Brazil has this very unique stance where we basically ignored or rejected the investor state system. Um, so a lot of people, uh, a lot of Brazilians uh, that join big law firms like ours, they feel like the prospect of doing investor state arbitration is something alien and a little bit daunting. Don't be scared to, to do that, to sort of go into those waters. I mean, you're at Columbia, so take Professor Berman's and Kabir's class, uh, you know, get get some of that uh, uh, framework in place. So you organize the, the you know, the, 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 the legal framework and the things that are going on. But then once you join a firm, reach out and do some work in that field. And in my own experience, I've, uh, over time, I've actually ended up doing 50% or more of investor state work and a lot of it in Spanish and not in Portuguese. And again, I think this has been highly beneficial for my own growth as a lawyer. And hopefully uh, it's also been uh, valuable to, to Deborah Voice. So, so those are my uh, two cents on that score. That's perfect. Lee. Thank you very much. I'm pretty sure that some Brazilians will start listening to their reggaeton playlists on Spotify after <laughs> after your comments exactly yeah <laughs> and uh yes yes uh, i totally agree with you uh regarding career projection uh Gaila, do you think there's uh should llms uh focus on having a long-term or short-term career in the us do they need to know uh What's their preference uh, from the start if they want a permanent position or an intern position? And uh, we would like to hear uh, you comment on that. And also after, we would like to uh, Jonathan also to share his views on this point. Sure. Um, no, that's it's a great question. It's a really important question. Um, I, I think the two things to always focus on, no matter what your answers are to these questions and what you're planning, whether it's in the short term or long term, is what do you want? And what are your boundaries? So what do you want? Um, I, I think it's important for any lawyer to think about what they want 
um, in the long term and short term. When you're approaching a law firm in the United States, um, as a general matter, most of the most of the law firms that do work in or a significant amount of work in international arbitration, whether it be commercial or investment arbitration, um, will have foreign associate or international associate programs. You know, Allen and Overy has it. Widen Case has it. <laughs> you know, I'm sure Debo Voice has some version of these of this sort of program. Um, these programs, as a general matter, are designed to be short term and um, and might take advantage of the time that most LLMs have to spend in the in the country post LLM, right? Um, and and as a general matter, the expectation um, is that the international associate would go back to their home country after that stint as an international associate. Um, there are certainly plenty of people who end up staying on. Um, they might uh, try to maximize the amount of time uh, that they're able to stay in the United States after their, L their LLM. They may um, law firm surf. <laughs> you might go from, from one law firm to another and do a series of different um, international uh, associate positions. Um, which is great. Um, I, but I do think in the end, it's, it's up to you as to what you want. And it's good for you to know, you need to know exactly what it is that you want from the situation. If you really do want to come to the United States and stay, then it's good for you to do this with your eyes wide open, knowing that this can be, it, it can be, a more challenging prospect than just st staying for a year or maybe two and going back to the country where you have your legal license, right? Um, because as I think um, speaking generally, um, most people will find that um, US law firms have a bias toward US JDs um, and most U.S. law firms, um, if, if you're really interested in becoming a permanent associate, um, most U.S. law firms will have this, you know, it's just an institutional bias. It's a cultural bias for, for people who have received their law degrees in the United States. Um, and there's, I think there's always going to be um, some extra work and and perhaps time involved for someone who's really interested in becoming a full-time associate at a U.S. law firm uh, when you got your legal degree from another country and you got your LLM in the United States. Is it impossible? No. Um, and I've worked with many uh, attorneys who have who got their law degrees in Latin American countries and then came to the U.S., got their LLMs, became international associates at a law firm and showed just that there's no way that we could do our work without them, <laughs> uh, pass the bar, and then eventually became an associate. It's, it's definitely a longer term process. And if that's something that you're interested in, um, you know, it, that's, it's something to be aware of, for sure. Um, and it's also, really important that you're aware that there are there are no guarantees. Um, there are very few guarantees there. If, um, if you're going at this without a USJD, and I think a lot of people think that there's a magic bullet, which is an LLM and the New York bar. Um, it's not, it's not necessarily. You could get your LLM and pass the New York bar or past the DC bar. I mean, depending on which city that you wanna, you wanna be in, that's something to keep in mind as well in your planning. If you wanna be in DC and you take the New York bar, um, DC firms may oftentimes have a problem making you an associate um, before you have practiced in good standing for five years in New York. <laughs> so, um, so please take that into consideration 
if this is really part of your long-term plan. Uh, and just knowing what the challenges are, what the biases are, um, the way that the the way the system is generally set up um, to uh, to be a, a bit more pref, you know, to give preferential treatment essentially to USJDs um, and LLMs. There are, there are a few more hoops that you need to jump through um, in order to become a, a full time associate, and I think. That there will, that there may always be um, partners or people in management at big law firms in the United States um, who might mm, give a little shade or give a little side eye to people who don't have a USJD because they think, well, what if our international arbitration practice experiences a lull? Is this associate as easily transferable to? a US litigation practice that a US JD would be. So they're thinking about things like that. Um, and there have been certain circumstances where I've recommended to people who truly want to become full-time associates in US law firms. Um, and if they have this option out there, I've said, well, um, what about getting your JD in the United States? Um, it, might, it might serve you better if you really, really do want to end up in the United States in the end, in the long term. So that's something to consider. And then the second question, I know I've been talking a lot. The second, the second question you have to ask yourself is, what are your boundaries? And I think this goes to Guy's point of, um, of not getting burnt out. Um, it's, <laughs> it, I absolutely agree. Please don't, please don't get burned out. Um, at the same time, it's a difficult prospect when you're dealing with Big law firm demands. Um, uh, you know, I, I yeah, <laughs> it's like telling someone get better. <laughs> um, and I, I, I do think that one of the best ways to maybe prevent against burnout is establishing your boundaries. So yes, plan for the future. Know what you want, and establish your boundaries. If you know that. Um, you want to work a certain way and you don't want to work another way, create your boundary and honor your boundaries. Um, because if you don't, if you don't know what you want and you don't have clear boundaries and you don't honor them, then you will get burnt out. Um, and it's not going to be, it's not going to be fun anymore. Nobody likes that. Yes, sure. Thank you so much, Gaila. Uh, Jonathan, could you comment also on this topic? Sure. If I think of my colleagues going down two hallways here, they are from Colombia and Argentina and Brazil and Ecuador and Ohio uh, and Venezuela, and I, you know, I could I could go on. They're they're a very diverse group of people and no two stories are alike. Everybody's story is different. The reason that U.S. law firms uh, ha have many partners who like people with JDs is because they associate that with the way a person thinks as an advocate and the way a person writes as an advocate. And uh, and so you can demonstrate those skills with or without a JD. Some of the people I mentioned have JDs. Some of them don't have JDs. Um, they each have different different stories and they each demonstrate those skills in different ways. So I would say uh, be bold and have fun with what you do. You know, when I was in my first month of uh, law school, I went to the first career discussion and the, the dean of career placement spoke. And I went up to him afterwards, told him my interest. And he looked at me and said, Mr. Hamilton, it sounds like you want to go places that you think are cool and do cool things. And I'm not sure that's the way that uh, the legal career works. 
But he was wrong. Uh, that is the way international arbitration works. In fact, that's exactly what we do. We go cool places. We do cool things. I've never found it boring, not a single day, um, ever. Uh, and so if you bring um, that kind of spirit and excitement to what you do, you're each bringing different problem solving skills to the puzzle. You know, in my case, I went to graduate school and produced documentary films before I became a lawyer. Nobody would have said, oh, that's just what we're looking for in a lawyer. But in fact, it was some of my best preparation for being a lawyer. I uh, studied history for many years. Absolutely. One of the best things I ever did to make me well equipped for the kind of uh, cases that I handle. So don't feel like you're trying to simply fit some robotic uh, imagination of the one way to be a stellar lawyer. What you want to do is come in and be a problem solver, to be uh, someone who brings ideas, who brings solutions, who's able to efficiently um, integrate and show your capacity for understanding sort of the project management comp components of what you do as a lawyer so you can find how to plug in your skill set and make a difference. So all of these things really can come through in how you communicate yourself uh, on paper and certainly in interviews as well. I will tell you that I've heard some funny things in interviews over over the years um, where people, you know, seem to, I don't know if they heard it, some talk like this, you know, these are the magic words that you need to say that will magically get you hired in a, in a law firm. And, the, and those kind of things never, uh, never worked well because they just sounded robotic. Um, ultimately, what law partners are looking for is what clients are looking for. They're looking for people who solve their problems, for people who bring solutions, for people who are comfortable to work with, for people who, for instance, I had um, uh, a recent LLM graduate a few years ago, and we prepared all sorts of documents for a witness uh, examination. And it was, it was great. I learned something um, from my colleague that wasn't on my mind. I gave some strategic guidance and we came up with interesting things. And, um, and so you can, each one of you, I'm confident, I can't see you all sadly, but I'm sure that each one of you has your own um, special thing that you can bring to this process. And don't panic or worry at the outset about what's gonna happen after nine months in another, you know, in a law firm. Absorb the experiences as you go and have some faith that the rest will work out over time. Great, thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. Now we have a question that we received from the audience. Uh, maybe Guy, you could address it, which is, uh, and maybe it is a matter of formalities, but here in the US, there are uh, plenty of titles for an attorney, say uh, foreign law clerk, say permanent associate, international associate. Could you elaborate a little bit on the differences uh, and, and what do they entail? Sure. Um, so my understanding, at least from the experience at my firm, is we, we, as others had said before, we have essentially two tracks. We have the permanent associate track and we have the international associate program. Sometimes we will also hire contract attorneys to work on specific projects, but that's a more temporary function, uh, more temporary still than the, the international associate. I think the things to keep in mind about the hiring process and projections uh, connected to each one of these functions is um, for the international associate program, because it's limited in time, it's usually nine months or 12 months. Uh, there is, uh, I think law firms will be looking for different things when they hire international associates. And in particular, the, the ultimate goal of those programs is really to strengthen relationships between the host firm in the US and the firm in Brazil or in Colombia or in Peru or wherever you're from. Um, so you're really pitching 
yourself, of course, always, but maybe not so much yourself, but this relationship and what can come out of it. And so, and it actually requires a sort of two-step dance between, I think, you and the person at your old firm who is sort of sponsoring this thing. And, and I think in very practical terms, it also means that you need to make sure that people do this outreach early on in the process because these decisions tend to get made earlier on and, and, and the spots will fill up for international associates. For the permanent associate positions, it is, and then I go back to something which again seems to be the common thread today, it's a lot more focused on your substance as an individual and as a lawyer because the firm is investing not on your particular uh, relationships and really in you as a person, as a lawyer. Uh, so then, of course, when you show up at an interview, you want to do as Jonathan said, you know, you want to tell a compelling narrative of what, you know, what, this is what I did before, this is where I'm at now, finishing Columbia, and this is where I see myself X many years in the future, and this is why you should hire me, right? Uh, and so, you know, and then these considerations that we've been talking about uh, from different angles come into play again, things like, of course, firms will have a preference for JDs, because for one thing, they have a lot more visibility into how to assess and compare JDs and they have LLMs, right? We all come from different legal backgrounds, from different schools. There's a problem sort of asymmetry of information where you really need to get over that hump. But even when you're in the law firm, and this is sort of my first point at, at the beginning of, of today, you know, you don't want to get pigeonholed, which is exactly what Gaila was talking about. You know, if this if this person can only do international arbitration out of Brazil and the only thing you can ever do is commercial disputes out of Brazil, but you know, there is a lull, what are we going to use them for? And so you've got to think about being versatile. And I think that wraps up quite nicely with what Jonathan said, just be bold, right? Of course, be bold responsibly. And so do things that you think you're going to be good at and try and really, uh, you know, garner the skill set that you need for that. Um, but but I think those are the sort of the two key differences. Now, now, one thing that came up before, which I think is relevant to this is, well, a lot of people don't know coming in, right? Do, do I want to be in the US for 10 years, 15 years, my entire life? And you should have an idea of where you want to be. And for some people, it's a lot clearer than for others. And it may be not only for professional reasons, but also because of personal circumstances. Uh, but one thing that I will say, uh, which I've witnessed over the years with many of my colleagues who were permanent associates, either from Brazil or other places, is even if you stick around in the US, and you want to then go back to your country of origin because you got married and you had a kid or because you simply want to go back for family reasons, you're not enjoying yourself that much. I think the local markets do uh, place a lot of value in the experience of uh, working at a big law firm. So it's not like by choosing to be in the US, you are necessarily shutting doors to your career in your home country. I, I typically see people leave uh, you know, top-notch places like a &O, and Wine Case and Debra Boys and others and, and get very good positions either within law firms or in-house counsel, either in the US or in their home countries. And so it's not necessarily sort of a mutually exclusive uh, choice. Although of course, like periodically you have to keep asking yourself, is this, is this the right track or should I start maneuvering somewhere else? Uh, but again, I, I think for me at least it's been a, a wonderful experience so far and I would uh, deeply encourage everybody to to go for it and give it a try. Great. Thank you very much, Guy, for this. It was a very useful input indeed. Now we would like to open the floor for final reflections on each one of the speakers. So Jonathan, if you like. Thanks very much. Thanks again to the group and to my fellow speakers as well. Uh, you know, I noticed somebody uh, posting a comment who is not from Latin America. And so let me broaden the comments here. One of my uh, colleagues is Eastern European and uh, and came into the firm working on Eastern European matters. And one of the best experiences we ever had together was hanging out in... <laughs> hanging out uh, in uh, a, a bar in Panama where we were for about three weeks for this huge hearing um, related to a project in yet another country. And um, while being Eastern European, 
uh, my colleague is actually particularly amazing with certain aspects of cases. And so I invited my colleague onto that case. And, uh, and you know, that part of the case was multilingual, actually, multiple languages in that case. And that piece of the puzzle was um, done in English and it was, and it was fine. And it was one of the most fun experiences we ever had and it ended well, so everybody was happy. So I just used that little example to underscore my point that um, when you go 10 years down the road or even 20 years down the road and you will look back to the uncertainty that you may have had as you're listening to a panel like this, you're going to go in different directions and all find interesting paths, basically. So um, be comfortable with yourself, be comfortable with your own skin. Uh, and as I said before, you know, be responsibly bold. Thank you very, very much. Um, Gaela, any thoughts? Um, yes. And I mean, first off, uh, something that I should have done in the beginning is thank everyone <laughs> for participating and thank every everyone here in Colombia for um, organizing this, Mateo, Renata. Um, it's always a pleasure to be here and to be at Columbia University. Um, it's a great, great program. And I think just final thoughts. Uh, one last thing that I that I didn't really get to um, and, and maybe reminiscent of Guy's comment about not being pigeonholed. I know one of the places where people talk about not being pigeonholed, particularly in a Latin American practice, particularly if you are um, bilingual or multilingual, is people say, don't, you know, don't just be a translator. You know, you're a lawyer, not just a translator. Uh, one of the places that this manifests is in the practice of legal culture translation. And I think that it's really incumbent upon everyone who works in this space in Latin America and international arbitration to recognize and to raise awareness of the fact that a lot of the people in this space and the people who are most valuable in this space are people who do act as not linguistic translators, but legal regime translators. Um, it is absolutely priceless to have people on your team who understand that there are some things in a civil law regime that might be translatable to a common law regime and vice versa. But there are some things that aren't, um, like a querella. How do you translate a querella if it doesn't even exist in common law? <laughs> what it, you know, how do you do that? It's really, really important to know your value, particularly when you've studied in two different legal regimes um, and you're able to come in and explain um, the differences and the similarities and the translation of that and exactly when there isn't a translation for something. So I definitely think that knowing your value, knowing what you want, setting your boundaries. These are things that will help you your entire career. And again, as Jonathan mentioned, you're at Columbia, you've got an amazing start. Um, you have professors Berman and Dugal um, to help you along your way, and they will help you on a very well-lit path to the career that you want. And just as a, as a last word, when I was in law school the <laughs> a long time ago, the field of investment arbitration really, di really didn't exist yet. This was when countries were signing the treaties that the disputes are under today. Things didn't really start get getting going until maybe the early 2000s, particularly in Latin America. And I had 
absolutely no idea when I was in law school that this was what I was going to be doing today. I did know when I was in law school and shortly thereafter that I was that I was very, very interested in a litigation type practice and very interested in a trial type practice. Um, and that's something that was confirmed when I was a clerk for a US federal judge as well. So I did know that I wanted to do that. I did know that I wanted to do something international. And as you know, and as Jonathan says, I wanted to go, go cool places and do cool things for sure. And so I went to a law firm where I thought that that would be most possible, that the doors to open for those possibilities would be most prevalent. Definitely didn't know about investment arbitration. <laughs> so, and I went, I went to that law firm and I did great work and I had a really good time and I went a lot of really cool places and I did a lot of really cool things. And it just so happens that that experience led me to what I do today, which is um, for the most part, um, international investment arbitration in Latin America. Um, that's, that's what happened. And it wasn't the result of extremely meticulous planning. It was the result of me doing what I really enjoyed. Great, thank you very much, Gaela, for sharing these super wise words with us. Now, Guy, a uh, final comment. Oh, it's very difficult to share wiser words after Jonathan and Gaela have spoken. Uh, but let me just start with some belated uh, words of gratitude to you, Kanata uh, and Mateo, for organizing this, and also to Jonathan and Gaela for participating with me. Uh, it's, it's a real, absolute pleasure to, to be with you on this. Um, I mean, just to pick up on, I, I guess, Gaela's theme, if, if you look at people like Jonathan and Gaela, when they were beginning their careers, which have been extraordinarily successful, as you can see, the world was a much different place. Uh, and I think that has in it a, a, a nugget or a lesson for us because we as LLMs, we feel a little bit like outsiders when we join a US law firm. And some things will seem like, you know, they're impossible or they haven't been done before, but little by little, thanks to people like Jonathan and Gaila and thanks to our predecessor LLMs, some of whom are now partners in big firms at Debit Voice, it happens at White and Case, at AO, and at all these places. Uh, so, you know, it, it is now possible to do all of this and so just, again, be responsibly bold and, and enjoy it along the way and see where things take you, right? And don't, and don't let the, the little mishaps will happen. Uh, uh, and just don't let that discourage you. And by little mishaps, I think, you know, for instance, in my own experience, uh, I joined Deb Boys in New York. After a year, I was on the OPT. I had to apply for the H1B. This is back in the days when the H1B lottery was particularly difficult. I didn't get a position uh, or, or a spot on the, on, on, the, on the lottery. And so I had to be transferred over to London, which for me was great. I love London and I had a great experience with colleagues over there. I think it made me a better lawyer uh, to also look at things from sort of an English law perspective. And then I came back, but I mean, you know, I could have sort of despaired at that moment and thought, um, you know, I'm gonna give up and just go back, it's too difficult. I now have immigration issues on top of all the other things. But things tend to work out okay in the end if you if you know what you want and you pursue it. And, uh, and again, I think our other two panelists are, are great examples of how uh, you know you, you can achieve a lot, even if it's something that might be a little bit vague right now. But then it really materializes into something absolutely short, extraordinary. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Gaela. Um, Actually, we couldn't be more amazed for hearing you. And definitely, this was a very inspiring panel. So on behalf of the Colombia International Arbitration Association, I would like to um, thank you all and thank also to the Arbitration Channel for streaming this event. And we look forward to hearing you again soon. Thank you.